Thought we'd start with a little something different. We got a manger scene up here from uh, that uh, we use at the church. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your mercy for this time of season when we can uh, enjoy the Christmas time and remember that Jesus was born in a manger, in a stable, and he lived and died for us. So it's a great time of the year. And we need this time, especially during this year that's been so crazy. So we're going to look today at something entirely different. So Lord, help us as we look into your word. May it be a fresh word for our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. For the last several weeks, I guess months in fact, about three months, we've been going through the book of Daniel. One thing that stood out as I was studying the book of Daniel was the prayer life that Daniel had. He was such a prayer warrior, such an intercessor, and he received such fantastic answers to his prayers. So I got to talk, thinking about that a little bit more, and I got uh, thinking, maybe we should go into prayer a little bit further. And today we're going to talk about intercession for families. And we're going to take the life of Abraham, because he interceded for his family. And I think from his life, we can get some real insight for our own lives in the intercession. Pick it up in Genesis, the 12th chapter. I'm going to just hit some high spots from there through about 19 or 21. And um, I won't read everything, but uh, just basically tell a story and try to develop what was going on between God and Abraham. Abraham had a unique relationship with God, but it started in the 12th chapter. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All families on earth will be blessed through you. That's a standard, basic promise that almost everybody knows that God gave to Abraham. God indeed blessed Abraham. He made him famous. He blessed him and everybody that uh, blessed him, he blessed. Those that cursed him, he cursed. And it says all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And that was through Jesus Christ. Jesus came through Abraham's family and he died on the cross for the whole world. So that is all part of what the promise was that God gave to Abraham. Then the next verse, I like this, I'd never seen it until this week. It says, so Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed, instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. I got to think, wow, Abraham didn't start his ministry really until he is 75 years old. And B and I just turned 75 last Sunday. I thought, wow, that's just exciting for me that, uh, hey, God's not done with us yet. Even us old people can be used by God. And Abraham really didn't start until he was 75. Then down in verse 7, the Lord says, I'll give this land to your descendants. The land that he was on, he'd give to the descendants. And that's the land of Israel. And it still goes to the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and then Jacob. And that progression went down through. And so there's a big struggle over in Israel today. Who owns the land? But 2,000 years before Jesus, 4,000 years ago, God gave that land to Abraham and his descendants. So we see this happening. And God gives them all these promises, all these blessings. But Abraham goes to God and says, God... You give me all these blessings, but the one that's going to inherit all this is a servant of mine. I have no kids. God says, I'll give you a child. So remember, he's 75, now 80, maybe a little older. We're not sure just how old he is at this point. And he says, uh, uh, God says, I will give you a son. Well, going on a couple more years and nothing happened. So Sarah comes up with this big idea, right idea, saying, you know what, I've got the servant. Abram, why don't you go lay with my servant and have a child through her 
that will be, I'll accept as my child, and then he will be the one that will inherit the blessing. And Abraham said, okay, if you insist, Sarah, that's what I'll do. I'll go lay with your servant, and we'll have a child. And they did. They had a child, and they named him Ishmael. Uh, Abraham loved Ishmael, but God said, that's not the one. I am going to give Mary a child. Or Sarah, excuse me, Sarah and child. And so he, uh, they laughed at that. They thought that was crazy because now Sarah is 90 years old and God's promising her in the 16th chapter or in the 18th chapter that you will have a child, Sarah. So they called him Isaac, which means laughter. Uh, they laughed at it. They didn't know really about it, but the Lord says, is anything too hard for the Lord? If the Lord gives you a promise, be careful not to try to fulfill it on your own. That's what uh, Sarah and Abraham did and had Ishmael. It didn't work out. It caused all sorts of grief and problems, and it still is to this day. Some of the warfare in the Middle East is because of Ishmael's children. The thing is that sometimes God gives us a promise. And we think we've got to figure out how to fulfill it. If God gives you a promise, let him fulfill it in his way and in his timing. Sarah does have a child then, and that child becomes Isaac, and that's the one that inherits the whole uh, shebang of everything he had. Now, when, when Abram left Haran and went to the promised land, he took with him his nephew Lot. While they're there, they were so prosperous and so blessed that they had goats, sheep, and cattle, it says. But they had so much, so many of them and so many servants that Abraham's servants and Lot's servants got in a fight because there's only so much land available, so much grass available. So Abraham comes with this idea. Lot, you choose where to go. If you want to stay here, I'll go down to the Jordan Valley and take my sheep, goats, and cattle down there. Or if you want to go down there, I'll stay here. But we need to divide. We can't be fighting like this. Lot looks at the Jordan Valley. It's full of nice, lush, green pastures. And he says, I'll take that. <laughs> well, the problem with that is that there's a couple cities down there called Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're very evil cities. Very sick, uh, sick uh, sexual cities. Six cities, uh, very wicked in everything they did. Lot uh, goes down and settles near Sodom, first of all. But um, then he ends up living inside Sodom. Now at this point, we come to uh, where Abraham needs to intercede for Lot. First he's interceding for a son, and he gets two sons, Ishmael and then Isaac. And Isaac was the one that promised. Now he sees Lot needs prayer too. So he starts praying for Lot. In the 18th chapter, we see the Lord and two angels come to visit Abraham and Sarah and say, uh, you know, I'm on my way down to Sodom and Gomorrah and I hear it's very evil. And if it's that bad, I want to know and I'm going to destroy those two cities. Abraham immediately gets very concerned and thinking, Lot's down there and he's going to get destroyed with the whole Sabrach Shemang. So he starts bargaining with God. He starts saying, God, look, you, you won't destroy the wicked with the righteous, will you? Uh, if there's 50 righteous people down there, will you save the city? God says, yes. If there's 50 righteous, I won't destroy them. How about if there's 45 righteous? Would you Save it then. Yes, I will. How about if there's 40? Yes, if there's 40. If I can find 40 righteous, I will not destroy the city. Then he gets a little more bold. First he's going by fives. Now he goes by ten. How about if there's 30? No, I won't destroy it for 30. How about 20? No, I won't destroy it for 20. How about 10? No, I won't destroy it. If I can find 10 righteous people down there, I will not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham's feeling pretty good. He said, there must be 10 righteous people in the whole uh, business there. And so 
they, two angels go on down to Sodom and they get attacked by the people there, by the men there. And they decide the only thing that can be done is to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Much of the sin is sodomy, homosexuality, but not only that, there's a lot of sexual sins according to some of the other uh, references in the Bible. So uh, sodomy is one of the big things and that's what they were going to do to the angels. But uh, that wasn't all. So homosexuality was a big, big problem. So they decide to destroy it, but they want to save Lot. And they tell Lot they come to destroy the city and for him and his family to get out of there. Now, Lot has a wife and two daughters. And he's got two would-be son-in-laws, two people that are very interested in his daughters. Maybe they were engaged, we don't know. But the thing is, uh, he goes to them and says, God's going to destroy the city tomorrow. You need to get out of here. Come with me. They laugh at him. They say, no way, no way. We're not going to do that. So what happens is uh, the angel at the next morning actually pulls him out of town and says, well, you've got to get going because fire and brimstone is going to rain down from heaven and just destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot takes off with his daughters and his wife, but his wife looks back. And she says, becomes a pillar of salt. Now remember, his flock was so big that he and Abraham couldn't even enjoy the same area. He goes down there full with sheep, goats, cattle, and a lot of servants. He leaves with just his two daughters. He loses everything. When you get close to the world, when you come to the point where you're dabbling between God and the world. You're going to end up being miserable, first of all, but often lose everything. That's what happened to Lot. He lost everything. See, God had, pre uh, had told uh, Abram that he was going to destroy Sodom, and Abraham prayed for protection. Now, he didn't give, in one way, he didn't get his prayer answered. He was praying that this whole city would be saved, but God couldn't find 10 people. But the inner thing that he was really concerned about was Lot. And God saw that inner struggle and that inner prayer, and he saved Lot and the two daughters. So Abraham gets his prayer answered. Lot is saved. But now let's talk about the results of Abraham's intercession. Now he's prayed for several different things. Uh, as a result of this particular one, Lot and his two daughters go up into the mountain, stay in a cave, but there's no men around. So his two daughters say, um, I think what we need to do is we're, we need to have children. And there's no men around. Let's get our father drunk and have children through him. They did. They had two, each had a child, Moab and Ben-Ami, who became the Ammonites. Now, where did they get this idea? They probably got it down in Sodom itself. It was such a sinful city, so much sexual sin down there. And so they thought, well, that's the way to do it. Be careful. When you get your kids into the place where there's a lot of worldliness going on, they will pick up that worldliness. They'll pick it up. Now, Lot got saved out of, out of Sodom and Gomorrah, but he ended up having two daughters and then two grandsons, and none of them served the Lord. In fact, the Moabites and the Ammonites were always enemies of Israel. Now, just because they're enemies, it doesn't mean that there wasn't some good ones. Ruth was from the tribe of Moab. But most of them were totally against them, and they worshipped the god of Molech. Molech was a very sexual god, and was a main, one of the main part of it, of the worship of Molech, was child sacrifice. They sacrifice their little children and throw them into the fire and burn them alive. That's where they came from. Okay? So, we have that. Then we have... Uh, Ishmael, uh, God said, "Your the whole line of promises is going down through, uh, through Isaac. And 
Abraham said, oh, how about Ishmael? Could you bless him too? God says, I will bless him too. And he did. He had 12 sons. And he had blessed Ishmael. But again, they became very much the enemies of Israel all the way through. Uh, they, they were fighting Israel. And even today, many of the problems in the Middle East is because of Ishmael and then Esau's sons. Uh, they fight against the Jewish people over there, the nation of Israel. So after 4,000 years, we're still reaping some of the problems that happened way back at 2000 BC. So Abraham got two big promises, uh, or two big answers to prayer. He had asked for protection for Lot, and God protected him. He asked for blessings on Ishmael, and God blessed him. Then we get to Isaac. God blessed Isaac too. He, Abraham prayed for the son for her wife Sarah, and Isaac was the answer. But God blessed them. But Isaac and his uh, descendants served the Lord for the most part. Sometimes they drifted away, but for the most part they served the Lord. And part of it, I think, is because of what uh, Abraham trained Isaac with. I'm sure he prayed for Isaac many times that he would have a real relationship with the Lord. But more than that, I believe the time that Abraham took Isaac up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him to God because he loved God more than anything else. It stood out in Isaac's mind that my father really loves God. And so he served God. Now, why do I go through all this? Because Abraham was getting his prayers answered. And sometimes we may also get our prayers answered. But what are we praying? Oftentimes, what we pray for our kids are for protection, like a lot, or we pray for blessing, like Ishmael. God answered both those prayers, but neither one ended up serving the Lord. What I'm saying is we got to be very, very careful of how we pray for our kids. Definitely pray for them for protection, pray for them for uh, blessing on their lives, but pray that they get a living relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing, because that's what's going to uh, send them either to heaven or to hell. Our relationship with Jesus Christ, whether he's our Savior and Lord, whether we have a real relationship with him or not, is what's really going to matter, whether they are going to live for God or not. I think so many times we're so busy asking God to bless our kids, heal our kids, deliver our kids, protect our kids. And we fail to understand that the basic need they have is to have a real relationship with God himself. Now that starts right in your home. Uh, you can pray all you want for a real relationship. But are you walking it out? Are you demonstrating it in your family? Do you have family devotions? Do you have a time where you read a devotional or from the Bible with your kids? every single day? Do you spend time praying for them in front of them and with them every single day? Do they walk it out? Do they know that Jesus Christ is extremely important in your life? You may say, oh yes he is, but are you demonstrating it on a daily basis to them? If you're just saying it and not doing anything about it, they probably are not going to serve the Lord. If you don't have a family devotions, then chances are less and less that they're going to serve the Lord. If you're not praying for them and with them, chances are they are not going to serve the Lord. Even though you may bring them to church every Sunday or talk about the Lord, they'll follow you. Is a real relationship with Jesus important in your life? I remember a pastor that moved from California up to, New, uh, up to Minneapolis, He's a Lutheran pastor, and he wrote a book on um, Christian family. And he said that um, he originally started off just in his bedroom praying, uh, shutting the door so no one would see him. And uh, he said part of what he just wanted to be alone, alone with the Lord, is part of it too that he just didn't want people to see uh, him praying on his knees, praying and uh, reading the Bible. 
Then all of a sudden he thought one day, you know what? My kids need to see this. I, they know what I'm doing, but they need to see it. So he opened the door so they could see what he's doing. He said that changed his family life. We can uh, talk all we want, but do they see us demonstrate a real love in our lives for Jesus Christ? That's where it's really important. I think Facebook has helped us a lot in this. Um, I've talked about a personal relationship with Jesus for years. I use those terminology. Some people say born again, some use this terminology and that terminology, but a real personal relationship. Now, on Facebook, you'll put your status and I'm in a relationship. What does that mean? That means that you're really communicating a lot with one person. You're growing in love with that person. You're spending time with that person more and more communicating. You're in a relationship. That's what this thing's all about. It should be the same way with us. We need to grow more and more in love with Jesus Christ. We need to spend time talking to him and letting him talk to us through the word of God. So are we in that living relationship? We may say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. But what does he mean in our lives and what difference does it make? Is it a real living relationship? Or is it pretty dead? Now, I can say this, and I know a lot of people that listen to this have already have kids, and they're out the door, and one thing or another, and they think, oh, I blew it here, and I blew it there. And No, no, I don't share this to put a lot of guilt and condemnation. Whether they're out the door, or they're all married and gone, or whatever, it's never too late to start praying seriously that they have a living relationship with Jesus Christ. It's never too late to demonstrate how... Much you love Jesus Christ by the talking. Now, and not by pinholing or buttonholing them and saying, you've got to accept the Lord, but showing them that Jesus really means something very special in your life. That's what you need to do. So uh, you can do all that. You can raise your kids and everything. But let me say one other thing. Your kids have a free will. Every one of our kids have a free will. One of the best stories I know is what happened to a family in China. They loved the Lord. They had two daughters. They sent them to a Christian school. This is before the communists took over. Both of them had the same education. They grew up in the same family. One of the girls married Chiang Kai-shek, who became the president of Free China and moved to Taiwan when the communists took over. The other daughter married uh, one of the generals, one of the top guys, in Mao's army. Both of them raised in Christian homes, both took totally different routes in their walk uh, because they have free will. So if your kids aren't serving the Lord today, keep praying for them, never give up on them. But don't beat yourself up because uh, they're not serving the Lord. Now maybe you've done some mistakes, we all have, every one of us. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. Ask the Lord for grace. Ask the Lord to really bless your kids and that they may come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Never give up praying. I think one of the biggest things that we pray for, Norman, is for our kids. And never give up. Never quit. The Bible says in the last days there will be a great falling away. And we don't want our kids to be those that are falling away. We want them to serve the Lord to the very end. Not how you start, it's how you finish that becomes not where people end up. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that every single person that hears this would uh, make a real effort to spend time praying for their kids for their salvation, for a living relationship with you. May they see there's nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever that's as important as that. Bless them, Lord. Send the right person out to uh, witness to them, to encourage them, to uh, see that they come to know you in a personal way. May every one of our kids live for you, and may they all join us in heaven one day. In Jesus' name.